Well, good morning. Um, this morning we are continuing our study of the book of James. And so we are coming now to the end of chapter one. And so in these verses um, that we're going to look at this morning, um, James is sort of wrapping up his, his introduction, um, sort of the, the beginning of his letter. He's laying out um, sort of why he's writing this letter, and he's, and he's giving us a framework really for where he's going um, and what we're going to see in the rest of the letter. And so this passage in particular, it tells us why James is writing the letter. It tells us what he hopes it will accomplish. But first, before he gets to any of that, he has to deal with a problem. Um, it's a problem that really is standing between us and, um, uh, and where we need to be as God's people. Um, and, and really the problem of that is, is that we're bad listeners, right? We're just, we're just not good at, at listening to one another. Um, some of us are worse at it than others, but bad listening really does tend to be a, a universal human problem. Um, the overwhelming majority of, of the comedies that we like and the tragedies, um, that we enjoy, they're built on the foundation of bad listening, um, right? If just two people would sit down and listen to one another, a lot of great stories would just never happen. Um, if Romeo and Juliet were better listeners, they might have just lived happily ever after. Very different story. Um, if any two characters, really probably in any of the John Wick movies, but certainly in the first one, if they just sat down and listened to one another, there, there probably wouldn't be any John Wick movies and a whole lot of people wouldn't die. Um, and of course, if the McAllister family, you know, if they had been better listeners, then Kevin would have never been left home alone. They would have gotten robbed, but he wouldn't have been left home alone. Um, and these stories work. These stories work because we can all identify with that premise. We, we can identify with, with bad listening. Um, I mean, one of the things that I, happens to me all the time, I think... I'm, I'm counting on the fact that, that something like this has happened to most of you, but if you've been talking to somebody and you only hear a little bit of what they said to you, and so then what happens when you ask them to repeat it? They will repeat back to you the only part that you actually did hear, right? It, it goes something like this, or like, you know, blah, 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 tomorrow night. And you're like, wait, no, oh, wait I'm, I'm sorry, can you say again? Tomorrow night. No, 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 it's it tomorrow night. And you're like, no, no, I, that, I heard that part. I didn't hear any of the rest of it. And that happens because bad listening is happening on both sides, right? As soon as I go, wait, I didn't hear you. You actually aren't listening to what I didn't hear. And so we just end up in this, we're just, it's not working. We have to start over. Um, and that kind of thing, you know, it, it can make for great comedies and, and it can make for great tragedies and it can make for great action movies. But in real life, it's super frustrating. And in stressful situations, that problem gets even worse. And that's why James is writing to these churches. He's writing to people who have been persecuted. Um, we talked about that um, back at the beginning of the letter. These are people who have been chased out of Jerusalem because they believe in Jesus. They've been scattered into every direction. They are the diaspora, the dispersed people. He's writing to them because they're under immense pressure and immense stress. And he knows how important it is to be good listeners. And he's writing because he knows that in stressful situations, in situations where listening is maybe the most important for us, that's when we do some of our worst listening. And so please follow along as I read from James chapter 1. Um, James is on page um, 1011 in the Pew Bibles. Um, and we're in chapter 1, um, and we're going to read verses 19 to 27. So please uh, follow along with me. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be slow to hear. Sorry, let will start over because that changes everything. <laughs> so let me get that right. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness 
the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but, dece but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Please pray with me. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are a God who speaks to us. And Lord, we pray that you would give us um, ears to hear, that you would make us good listeners this morning, that we would hear your gospel promises, and that we would believe them for your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So immediately in this passage, James identifies the problem that he sees in the church. Particularly in stressful situations, we tend to be slow to hear and quick to speak and quick to become angry. So in other words, when we're stressed, we like to talk more than we like to listen. And when this happens, we also tend to get angry because what happens if you're talking and you feel like nobody's listening to you? It's, it's, it's normal to then get angry. There's a, there's a commercial for Halifax Bank um, that shows all these people in these, these various scenes of, of daily life. The camera just sort of zooms through all of these houses. And so you just see these little glimpses of like a kid getting ready for bed and a, you know, a girl doing her homework. And one of those scenes is this husband and wife and they're standing in their hallway and they're arguing with one another. And the wife is clutching this handful of, of paper, which are presumably bills. Um, and you hear just a, a bit of their conversation as the camera sort of zooms through. Um, but what you, you, what you do hear is the wife is shouting, no, 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 you said you were going to pay them. And over the top of her, the husband is shouting, you always do this, you never listen. You know, and then it just sort of goes on to like the next scene. And that's all you hear of the conversation. But honestly, that's, that's all we need to hear of the conversation. We, we know where this conversation is going. Um, we've probably been in a conversation like this one. Um, it's the kind of conflict that, that all of us can identify with, whether it's husbands and wives who are arguing over finances, uh, whether it's parents and children who are arguing over homework or bedtime or taking a bath. Um, you can tell what we argue about um, in my house. Um, or coworkers who are arguing over, you know, project deadlines or who was supposed to do what, um, or complete strangers who are arguing about traffic or the bus taking too long to arrive or, or whatever it is, right? These are situations that we, we can feel. We know what this feels like. And James gives us a very stern warning because in these situations, our tendency is to get angry. And we get angry because we feel like we're right and everybody else is wrong and nobody is listening to us. But the warning that James gives us is this. The anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So in other words, our anger, it's not going to produce what God wants for us. But really, it's also not going to produce what we want. Right? It's not actually going to give us what we want either. So then what should we do? I mean, the short answer, the short answer is just be better listeners. I mean, I could just say that, like, just don't be bad listeners, be good listeners. And then we could just all go out into our week and then fail at being better listeners. Um, we, we want to be good listeners. We need to learn to become good listeners. But how do we do it? How do we become specifically good listeners of God's word? Because that's the thing we need to listen to. So how do we become good listeners? Um, there's, there's three steps because I'm a Presbyterian minister and we like to do things in threes. Um, 
I, th I think that's why Tim Keller limited himself to three things in that introduction to the New City Catechism. We like threes. Um, so we're going to have three. Um, we have to hear God's word. We have to accept God's word. And we have to obey God's word. So James says in verse 21 that God's word is able to save our souls. Right? This, this word given to us is able to save our souls. Now, when, when James says souls, he doesn't mean um, that our souls are somehow separated, you know, like saved separately from our bodies. Um, you know, if we die before Jesus comes back, that happens. But when Jesus come back, comes back, he, he puts all that back together um, in the resurrection. Um, so he's not talking about sort of just your soul in some sort of like, you know, um, disintegrated view of humanity. When he says soul, he's talking about our entire being, all of who we are, is saved by the word of God. In body and in spirit, God saves us, and he saves us by the power of his word. And so that means that first and foremost, we have to hear that word. We have to hear God's word, his message of salvation. If it's going to hear, if it's going to save us, we have to hear it. And so this is why when we started James, we, we spent a whole sermon looking just at James 1.1 1, 1 because of what James says in that opening to this letter. When James calls Jesus both Lord and Christ, he is, he is in essence preaching the gospel. He's proclaiming the gospel. He is announcing what he believes about who Jesus is and what he has done. Um, he's proclaiming the message about the eternal word of God, the word made flesh who came into the world to save us. And so in the context of this letter, right, James, James has already confessed who Jesus is and what Jesus does. And so in the context of this letter, James, when he says hearing, he also means believing, right? James is equating hearing and believing in the way that he handles this text. Because he's already referred to his audience as the 12 tribes, which is sort of this Old Testament shorthand for the people of God, the people who belong to God. Um, he's also called them brothers, right? Which means he considers them to be members of the same family of faith. He's writing to brothers and sisters you know, who are united by faith as the family of God. This is a letter that's written to churches, right? So it's written to people who believe in Jesus. And why do they believe in Jesus? Because they have heard God's word. Without hearing God's word, we can't change. Not really, not in the ways that God wants us to. Without hearing God's word, we can't produce what James calls the righteousness of God. In other words, we can't produce in our lives what God wants, what God delights in, what he hopes for from us. So in other words, without hearing God's word, we don't know how he wants us to live. And of course, this is how relationships always work. If you want to know how to please someone, what do you need to do? You need to listen to them. You need to let them tell you what they like, what makes them happy. You have to let them talk about their likes and their dislikes, about their hopes and their dreams, about their fears, about their past hurts. You have to listen to all of that in order to know what someone wants and what someone likes. Now, because I know my wife, Liz, one of the things I know about her is that she likes cards, you know, greeting cards. Um, she, she likes to send cards to people. She loves to receive cards from people. She especially likes cards that have a really, really good design that's printed on them, um, that, that cards that are printed on like a heavy, good quality paper. She really likes it if it's embossed. Right? If it's an embossed, she's just like, oh, this is, yes. Um, but more than all of that, I mean, she likes the physical, ta tactile things about the card. But more than that, she loves the personal attention and the care that go into choosing a card and then writing a message inside that card. Um, she likes to save cards because of all of the things that these cards hold, the memories and the thoughts, and it's sort of a memento of a relationship. And I know these things about Liz because... You know, we've been married for 20 years because I've listened to her. So does that mean 
that I'm really good at buying cards for my wife? Do you think it means that I do that all the time? Or frequently? Or even occasionally? No. Like, sadly, no, I, I don't. Um, I bought a card for her yesterday because I knew I was going to talk about this this morning. Um, so I had to pay it forward a little bit. Um, but no, because even though I know what makes her happy, and even though that's a pretty easy thing to do, I often don't think about it, and I don't do it. Because I personally, my view of cards is that I think that they're unnecessary. I think if you're going to put it on a gift, you could just put a piece of paper on there with the name on it. You don't really need the card. I think the good cards, the kind of cards that Liz likes, I think they're too expensive. Um, because I think that inevitably, cards are really just fancy clutter. Right? They're just things that, like, they just gather. They multiply if you put them in a drawer. And we just need to get them out of our house. So if I'm not buying cards for Liz, it's because I'm being a bad listener. Because I'm thinking about what I want. I'm not thinking about what she wants. I'm listening to myself more than I'm listening to her. And that same thing is true of our relationship with God. We learn how to please God by listening to him. I mean, one of the most fundamental things that we know about God is that he speaks. He speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us, which means it's vitally important then that we listen to him. If we have a God who speaks, we ought to be a people who listen. But it's not only important that we hear the word of God, we actually have to listen to the word of God more than we listen to ourselves. Listening to ourselves is really another way that we can define sin, right? Sin is, is, is not living up to, not following, not obeying the word of God in other words, not listening to God and listening to ourselves. It's doing what I want instead of what God wants. And so if we want to be good listeners, according to James, not only do we have to hear the word of God, we also need to accept the word of God. Right? So hearing is hearing and believing, believing that what God has said is true, hearing that, listening to that, and also accepting the word of God. That's the next step. That's the next step, that, that we actually have to believe and accept that the word of God is the rule for our lives, that it actually has authority. James you know, refers to it now as law, because law has sort of certain obligations. If you accept the word of God, it has authority over how we live. James tells us to put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. So in other words, we have to rid ourselves of our sin. We have to accept that God is in charge of how we live our lives. And so we do this by accepting the word of God. One of the first things that, um, that really probably all of us do or have done as new believers is that we begin to study the Bible. We've heard the word of God and we've believed the word of God. We believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And so we begin to study the Bible more in depth so that we can understand more deeply this faith that we've come to. It's a big part of how we begin to accept the word of God as the rule for how we now live. Because God calls us into a personal relationship, then one of the things that we do is we study the Bible individually. And this is what we, we commonly would call our, our devotional reading. We study the Bible because we are devoted to God, because we love him, because we want to be better listeners. We want to please him. But God has also called us into a family of his people. He hasn't just called us individually. He's called us into this body of people, his church. And so we study the Bible together. We need to study the Bible together. And so we do this through the preaching of the word in church. We can also do this through small groups, through home study groups. Um, and this is, this is what the Bible refers to as discipleship. Right? So we need to study devotionally and in terms of discipleship. We study the Bible together because in Christ, we belong to one another. And so if we aren't studying the Bible, then it's highly likely that we are listening more to ourselves than we're listening to God. 
Because studying the Bible, studying the Bible is, is a vital way that we learn to put away sin and to accept the word of God, the law of God in our hearts and in our lives. And so then finally, if we want to be good listeners, and we have to hear the word of God and we have to accept the word of God and we have to obey the word of God. Or as James puts it, we have to do what it says. James, like all of the books in the Bible, was, was originally written by hand. It was written on a manuscript and, and modern conventions that we're used to, like underlining and bold print and italics, like those things don't exist. Um, and so when he's writing, um, any author in this age, when, when they're writing, if they really wanted to get a point across, they would repeat it. Because saying something twice is a really good way to get people to remember it. Saying something twice is a good way to get people to remember it. And so how many times does James tell us to be doers of God's word? You can look and count if you want. I sort of set you up. It's kind of a trick question. He says it three times. He doesn't just repeat it. Right, The way in a letter like this, the way you want to point across is you repeat something. James says it three times. So how important do you think it is to James that we are doers of God's word? He thinks this is pretty important. Because he says if we aren't doers of God's word, then we are deceived. We have fooled ourselves. Imagine if I told you that I was a chef because... I've read Julia Child's Mastering the Art of French Cooking. And, and, and I mean, like, I didn't just skim it. I mean, I know it's a big book, but like, I mean, I read it very carefully. Every word, every page. And so then you, got, so then you would ask the obvious question, like, oh, well, so like, have you made all of the recipes? And I say, well, no, I've, I haven't made any of the recipes. I don't need to do that. I've, I've read the book. I've read the whole book. And what does that say about my claims to be a chef, yeah, a little, a little dodgy, right? Like, I'd, like, if I want to be a chef, I can't just read a book about learning to be a chef, about learning to master the art of French cooking. Like, you have to do what it says. If I want to cook like Julia Childs, I've got to do all the things that Julia Childs did, and actually do it, not just read about it. I would be deceived. James says we are deceived in the same way if we aren't doers of God's word. If we just read it and don't do it, we have deceived ourselves. This is what he says. He says that we are like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Now, there are some um, uh, pastors, commentators, there are people, there's, people are all over on the map on kind of what, what the mirror means here. Um, we can overthink the mirror as an illustration. Um, some people sort of think like, oh, it, like it shows us our flaws and it shows us what's wrong with us. And there's all these different threads. Um, but I think, you know, if that were the case... Um, you know, then forgetting what we like would look like would, would also kind of be this thing about forgetting our need for God's word. And that, that's a true thing. Um, we can easily forget our need for God's word. But, but James really kind of makes that point when he's talking about hearing and accepting the word of God. Um, I think that the, the illustration here is actually much more simple. This is one of the places where James sort of teaches a lot like his, his half-brother, Jesus. He just takes an ordinary, everyday thing that we would understand and just says, hey, it's like this. Um, and so I think the function of the mirror here is not, it's not that it shows us our flaws or that it shows us our imperfections, that somehow we could look into the mirror and we'd see what's wrong with us. That's actually something that people do because, you know, of our insecurities and our doubts and our fears. And I don't think God is trying to, you know, mess with us in that way. Um, rather, I think what the mirror does is it shows us something that we can't see on our own. Right? It shows us something that we can't see without help. Um, I look into a mirror when I shave because I can't see my own face, right? Like I need the mirror to show me something I can't see on my own. So I don't look at the mirror and study my face and figure out where the whiskers are and then go out into the hallway and shave. 
Right? I keep looking in the mirror and I do what it shows me. And I think that is, is, is how we look at God's word. It shows us something that's true and it shows us something that we can't see on our own. We look intently into the word of God and it shows us how to live, right? We know what's wrong in our lives. We know when we've sinned. We, we know when we're ashamed of something, we're in, when we're embarrassed by something, when we failed at something. But the word of God shows us how we ought to live, what our lives ought to look like. It shows us how to please God. And it shows us how to produce what James calls the righteousness of God. We can't see that without God showing it to us. And so the question for us is, do we look into the law like someone who looks into a mirror and then just ignores what they see? Or do we look into the law of God, into the word of God, and then do what it says? James says that ignoring the word of God, specifically not doing what the word of God says, that produces a religion that is empty and worthless. And then he tells us what pure religion looks like. It bridles its tongue, it visits orphans and widows in their affliction, and it keeps itself unstained from the world. And these three things are what James has in mind when he talks all the way back in verse 20 about producing the righteousness of God. It's these things, controlling your tongue, caring for the helpless, and keeping yourself unstained from the world. And these are things that James is going to develop throughout the rest of this letter. Controlling the tongue is going to be you know, expounded in chapters three and four. So we're not, going to, you know, we're not going to get into these today. Concern for the helpless is going to be the focus of, of a lot of chapter two. And avoidance of worldliness is going to be explained in greater detail when we get to chapter four. But in short, this is what listening looks like. Being good listeners means that we do what God's word says. And there are few things that could actually be so simple to understand and yet so incredibly difficult to do. Right? How do we become good listeners? We do what God says. We live in a world where countless churches, countless churches, they've decided that their pastor should lead the church like a CEO of a successful company rather than like a servant leader like Jesus. See, we've, we've looked at the world and we've seen what success looks like. And so we're just trying to copy that in the church. And the growth of these churches is often, it's rapid and it's exciting. But eventually you start to hear these stories of people who have been chewed up along the way. You know, families who were driven out of the church over a disagreement with the pastor or employees, um, uh, staff who were fired because they questioned a particular decision in the church or employees who were, who were bullied and abused by a pastor who demanded subservience to him. And when one of these pastors, one of these power-hungry pastors, when he resigns or takes a leave of, a leave of absence, you know, we, we act surprised. We shouldn't be surprised by this. Because if we, have, if we have looked to pastors to lead with worldliness, we shouldn't be surprised when they lead with worldliness. See, pastors who haven't controlled their tongues or cared for the vulnerable or kept themselves from worldliness, they're practicing a religion that James tells us quite plainly is worthless. It doesn't matter how big your church is. That is worthless, empty religion. They've been bad listeners. They've listened to themselves or they've listened to the world more than they've listened to God. So how do we do better? How do we, how do we get better? And how do we listen better? We have to hear the word of God. We have to accept the word of God. We have to obey the word of God. And here's the tricky bit and also the best bit. We can't do any of that. We can't do that on our own. There's a very distinct progression and order to these commands. They happen in this order for a reason. Because we first have to believe that Jesus is who he says he is and he's done what he says he's done. We have to believe he's Lord and Savior. We have to accept that the word of God is the rule for our lives and it shows us how we ought to live. And then we have to do what it says. These things all have to happen in that order. If we try to do the things 
without believing in who God is, that's also empty religion. The greatest need that any of us has is our need for Jesus. We have to start there. And then, and then this is what we get. Verse 21, James says, receive, the meek, receive with meekness the implanted word. If we belong to Jesus, if we believe and we trust in him, then his word is planted in us, right? God's word, it's not something outside of us. It's planted in us. On Friday afternoon, um, Finn brought home this little bean sprout that he had planted at school. Um, uh, his class was reading Jack and the Beanstalk. And so they all planted these little beans into little pots of soil. And the only thing that is ever going to sprout out of that little pot is a bean sprout, right? It's, it's not going to produce strawberries. It's not going to grow bananas. It's only going to produce beans because that's what was planted in the soil. God plants his word into the hearts of his people, into the hearts of those he loves, into the hearts of those who believe in him. And what God has planted will produce what God desires. The word planted in us will produce the righteousness of God because God planted it. And so do you want to be a better listener? Do you want to live a life that produces the righteousness of God? Well, Jesus says, turn away from your sin. Turn to Jesus who died for your sin. Believe in Jesus. Believe that not only did he die, but that he rose again to break the power of sin and death forever and trust in him and trust him as your savior and as your Lord, as the one who has the ultimate authority over how you live your life. And he will plant his word in you. And his planted word will accomplish his purposes. It will grow the fruit that God wants to see in us. Because by his implanted word, God gives us life. And he gives us the ability to live for him. Trust in Jesus. And he'll give you ears to hear his word, to listen to his word. And he will give you faith to accept his word. And he will give you the strength, his strength, to do what it says. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Father, we pray that by faith you would plant your word in our hearts, that you would take away our hearts of stone, that you would give us hearts of flesh, and that you may grow in us what you long to see, what you have made us to be. For your glory, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.